Next, we're going to turn to talk about non-narcotic pain relief and what are called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs. This will be a relatively short introduction to these drugs. They're primarily available over the counter. You probably have a great deal of experience with them. They're an important part of pain management. We'll talk a great deal more about um, narcotic pain relievers in our next lecture. But let's turn now to talk about NSAIDs. Uh, I want to first introduce you to the idea of pain management and some of the best ways to view pain management. We'll talk about what are called non-selective COX inhibitors, which are the over-the-counter drugs you're familiar with, aspirin, ibuprofen, acetaminophen, uh, naproxen sodium. Then we'll talk about what are called COX-2 inhibitors, and there's really only one on the market currently, which is available by prescription, which is Celebrex. We'll also talk about um, ginger uh, as a potential COX-2 inhibitor as well. But let's uh, first talk about pain management. We're going to talk about acute versus chronic pain, provide a brief introduction to these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, talk about the effects of these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and then talk about some steps that we might want to take prior to thinking about an opioid use. Opioids or opiates are um, powerful pain-relieving drugs. They're an important tool. They're certainly um, well used to treat um, injury or pain associated with surgery. Really important to, to manage pain in those situations, but obviously they have a great deal of potential for abuse. Um, so we'll talk more about that. Uh, let's first talk about what we call acute versus chronic pain. Acute pain results from an injury disease or inflammation often com comes on suddenly, can be diagnosed and treated, and usually, is usually self-limited. That is, it's going to end because the person is going to get better. This is the primary use for narcotic pain relievers, Vicodin, Lortab, those kinds of drugs. They're used to treat a specific injury and to keep the person from experiencing pain until the injury is healed. Again, could be from a sports injury, car accident, burn, uh, or could be post-surgical pain. All those are important things that we need to think about. Chronic pain represents the disease by itself, and it is made worse by environmental and psychological factors. It persists over time, is resistant to medical treatment, and causes significant problems to both patient and family. Pain management is an integral, integral part of treating chronic pain. So it's important to treat chronic pain because it really does associate with a wide variety of uh, other medical problems. Now, we want to try to treat chronic pain usually with other drugs other than uh, opiates. And we're going to talk more about that when we get to, to those kinds of drugs. But first, let's talk about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs. Um, these non-narcotic pain relievers, again, are usually called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They're called that because steroids are often used to treat inflammation. In fact, they're a very powerful way to treat inflammation. Uh, oftentimes, steroids will be injected directly into a joint, so corticosteroids or cortis um, cortisone can be treat injected directly into an inflamed joint to treat uh, arthritis or some sort of injury. I'm sure some of you have had this procedure done. I certainly have. Uh, other oral steroids, like methylprednisone, will often be used to treat inflammation associated with uh, injury. These drugs are non-steroidal. These drugs act at the local site of injury to reduce inflammation and to block nociceptors, which are pain impulses. So these nociceptors we'll talk about more in our next lecture are the pain receptors that actually generate the pain impulse from the site of injury. NSAIDs block what is called a cyclooxygenase, or COX, which is an enzyme which is used to synthesize prostaglandins, which cause both pain and inflammation. So the generation of these prostaglandins is an important process for causing both pain and inflammation and also fever, which we'll talk about here in a moment. So again, these are often referred to as COX inhibitors. There are two different uh, COX enzymes. We'll talk about COX-1 mediates the gastrointestinal tract and blood platelets. And COX-2 is associated with inflammation and our perception of pain. When we are trying to manage an individual's pain, there are several steps we can take uh, prior to... Sorry, I turned the page before I was supposed to. Let's finish up talking about the effects of NSAIDs. Um, again, NSAIDs are primarily used to reduce inflammation. Um, they are important for reducing body temperature, 
for those with a fever, what's called antipyretic. Reduction of pain without sedation, uh, that is you get analgesia without being sleepy, which is again important. Uh, however, we do also get inhibition of platelet aggregation, which is an anticoagulative effect, which are the non-selective COX inhibitors. Uh, this is seen as both a positive and a negative side effect of these drugs. In fact, aspirin is used primarily for its, its um, anticoagulant properties and less as a pain reliever in uh, modern times. So these drugs do have several important effects that are important for therapy. So now we'll go on to step take, into prior, take prior to opioid abuse. Um, NSAIDs are our first line of defense when it comes to treating pain. They're probably your first line of defense because you have them at home. You can take them for a headache, you can take them for any kind of injury, and they are effective for that. And these tend to be things like aspirin, ibuprofen, naproxen sodium, uh, and acetaminophen. Um, we can also treat chronic pain with an antidepressant with some sort of norepinephrine activity uh, are the ones that are most effective for treating chronic pain. We can also use an anticonvulsant analgesic like um, gabapentin or neurontin. Um, and then finally, long-acting opioids. But again, that's our last line of defense. Uh, and we'll talk about those in later lectures. So let's talk about the non-selective COX inhibitors. Provide a brief introduction. We'll talk about aspirin, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, and some other miscellaneous non-specific non NSAIDs. Non-selective COX inhibitors inhibit both the COX-1 and COX-2 enzymes. Uh, the prototypical NSAID is aspirin. Off Often these drugs are referred to as aspirin-like drugs. And the whole pain relief section of the grocery store, pharmacy, Walmart, all of these include uh, NSAIDs, and they are all uh, non-selective COX inhibitors. So they're used as analgesics and for long-term treatment of pain and inflammation from things like arthritis or sports injury. Um, they have significant effect on pain, inflammation, blood platelets, and GI tract. A great deal of, of pain, particularly associated with something like arthritis or a uh, sports injury or just a workout injury, uh, is inflammation. So if you can treat the inflammation, you've treated the pain. And so the inflammation is generally the cause of pain. So if you can treat that, you can eliminate the pain as well. Fortunately, these drugs treat both. And so it's important to make sure you're using both strategies, treat the pain and the inflammation. Aspirin is, of course, the oldest and most commonly used. When I was a kid, we had aspirin, we had Tylenol. These were our two choices. Um, aspirin was, AS, sorry, most effective for low intensity pain. Its dosage quickly reaches the ceiling beyond which no increasing effect is seen. So around 650 to 1300 milligrams. The typical um, aspirin dose is 325 milligrams. So two uh, to four pills is going to get you as much uh, pain relief as you're ever going to get. Now, that's probably going to be associated with some gastrointestinal distress. Aspirin is sometimes difficult for people to tolerate. Um, aspirin also has an antipyretic effect from the inhibition of prostaglandin synthesis in the hypothalamus. Um, there is caution against using aspirin in children because it is associated with Rye syndrome, so probably best to use Tylenol instead or acetaminophen. Um, Aspirin does have significant anticoagulant properties. In fact, this is it, the primary reason it's used now. It's used in low doses to prevent myocardial infarction uh, or heart attack. And in fact, a lot of people take a single aspirin a day simply for that reason. Uh, unfortunately, because of the gastric difficulties with aspirin and its um, anticoagulant properties, there is an increased risk of gastric bleeding, uh, which can be problematic. So that's aspirin, very well known, it's cheap. You can get a bottle of aspirin for like a buck. Um, probably one of the cheapest, uh, easiest things to use for treating pain, and certainly inflammation and fever. Acetaminophen, which is most commonly known as Tylenol, uh, has little efficacy in treating inflammation. So if you have um, pain from an injury or muscle soreness or a sore knee, uh, sore shoulder, Tylenol is not the drug to use. Probably not the best drug to use for hangover either for a couple of reasons. One, there's certainly some inflammation associated with alcohol use. Um, but you also want to be careful with Tylenol or acetaminophen because it is uh, hepatotoxic. And so combining alcohol with acetaminophen is uh, not good for the liver. So you probably want to avoid that. Um, acetaminophen does not inhibit platelet functioning, so it is 
There's no use for that particular um, effect. It's safe for children to take for fever. It does produce less gastric distress, but it does have significant hepatotoxicity. So you want to limit your use of acetaminophen if you're somebody who drinks alcohol on a regular basis. Uh, combining acetaminophen with alcohol is a significant uh, liver damaging proposition. In fact, most people who abuse drugs like Vicodin, it's not the hydrocodone that gets them into trouble. It's the significant dose of acetaminophen that causes damage to their liver, which results in most of the health effects. So we'll talk more about that later. Um, there is a significant risk of hypertension from acetaminophen in women, so there is caution warranted there. Uh, our next non-selective COX inhibitor is ibuprofen or Advil. Uh, ibuprofen can cause some gastric distress, but less so than aspirin. Uh, the typical over-the-counter dose is 200 milligrams per pill. Um, the prescription dose of uh, ibuprofen is 800 milligrams, which is about its ceiling for effectiveness. Much like aspirin, it has a limit uh, about how much you can take. For joint pain, um, ibuprofen has been shown to be more effective even than codeine in relieving joint pain because it does treat that inflammation, and that's really important. Uh, again, this is approved as an analgesic and anti-inflammatory and does have some significant anticoagulant properties. Again, uh, something to watch out for if you're somebody who takes a lot of Advil and you want to be careful not to injure yourself because you can end up uh, with significant bleeding. Uh, the last uh, NSAIDs I want to talk about of the non-selective non COX inhibitors are just some various and uh, available uh, NSAIDs. Uh, Mobic, Naproxen and um, Depro are others. The only of these available is Naproxen, which is usually thought of as a leave. It has a little bit longer efficacy, um, and it does appear to exert some cardioprotective effect, um, and it is certainly an anti-inflammatory. So if you aren't somebody who tolerates ibuprofen well, uh, Naproxen is probably a, a safe way to go. Again, always talk to your doctor about these things. So. One of the issues with the non-selective COX inhibitors is they do have effects on the gastrointestinal system and platelet functioning because of the COX-1 inhibition. So there has been some attempts to introduce COX-2 inhibitors that don't affect COX-1. The problem is because of the anticoagulant properties of COX-1 inhibitors or the non-selective COX inhibitors, there is some risk of cardiac event with COX-2 inhibitors because it seems to actually have an effect on coagulation that's not in the direction we want. So um, keep that in mind. So COX-2 plays a role in both inflammation and cancer. COX-2 inhibitors, as well as aspirin, may reduce the risk of cancer. So um, again, an aspirin today is probably not a bad idea. Uh, there are fewer gastric effects from these drugs, but again, only one remains available. The others were pulled for their cardiac effects. Um, so Celebrex uh, is our only available COX-2 inhibitor in the United States. It's as effective as aspirin in reducing pain and inflammation. It has a 50% reduction in gastric problems compared to aspirin and has no anticoagulant properties. Now, this isn't something everyone can take. If you're someone who's allergic to sulfa drugs, you cannot take uh, Celebrex, but aside from that, it is something that you can uh, think about taking. So, I uh, want to talk Next about ginger, because apparently my slides are out of line, <laughs> out of order. Um, ginger is found to be a natural COX-2 inhibitor. Uh, ginger, uh, there is evidence that ginger is as effective as aspirin in treating arthritis pain and inflammation. The problem is getting the dosage correct. Uh, it appears to also be effective in treating motion sickness and morning sickness. However, I just read a, um, a paper by uh, Dr. Eric Newson in the psychology department here at Clemson that uh, argues against ginger as a treatment for motion sickness, um, but it certainly has been associated with uh, treating indigestion. In fact, that's one of the reasons why ginger is often consumed at the end of a meal. Um, ginger supplements are available, uh, and again, it is a natural COX-2 inhibitor, so if you're someone who has inflammation, this might be an option, again, because the uh, other COX-2 inhibitors, aside from Celebrex, are no longer available, and these include Vioxx and Baxter. Vax was approved for treatment of osteoarthritis, acute pain, and menstrual pain. Was removed from the market due to increased risk of heart attacks. Uh, same thing with Baxter. Was also very effective in treating osteoarthritis and chronic pain, but was also pulled due to cardiac risks. All right, well, that's our introduction to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We'll turn next to talking about narcotic pain relief.